when I read something like a, a novel by Dostoevsky, I think, well, is this true? And the answer is, well, those precise events never happened. So on that basis, it's not true. But then there's something wrong with that description because the characterizations in Dostoevsky are so true that in some sense, they've never been surpassed. I, I do believe that the stories in scripture happen, but I don't believe that the people who recorded them had to do it in a way that it counts for our, our forensic uh, nature, let's say. I think that they're doing it in a manner to show this very pattern in the story of what it is that, that was happening in the world. If you're going to be a believer, you have to be able to say, in the words of the creed, that, that, you, be, that you believe in the virgin birth, that you believe, most importantly, in the resurrection. Many of us can walk 99% of the way there in terms of belief in the, in the, in the truth of the story or as Betjeman puts it, but is it true, is it true? And then stumble on the last thing. Well guys, as you saw, we are doing a uh, kind of reaction to this uh, video of Jonathan, Douglas, and Jordan discussing some pretty, uh, as you saw in the intro, some pretty deep topics. Very much so. Yeah, this is a this is a big brain conversation. If you listen through the whole thing, it wears you out. <laughs> you gotta um, have a love for philosophy. Yeah, deep inside of you, you have to have that love for language and philosophy. Yeah, to enjoy this. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's just gonna sound like babble, <laughs> <laughs> pointless babble. Yeah. So get on this Willy Wonka train with us, guys. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> It'll be fun. Lots of ethereal ideas, lots of conceptual ideas, lots of philosophy. It's, it's. I like this stuff. I've Dude, always, been, I've I always been intrigued these by guys, it. Like these are the biggest brains, some of the biggest thinkers out there. So it's great to hear them kind of uh, spar on this topic. Because yeah. you see, yeah, Jordan and Douglas aren't believers, and then you got Jonathan that is, and they all kind of got different perspectives. So it's a good conversation. It is. It totally is, and this won't get you any dates, guys. So. Just remember that. This type of conversation <laughs> will not get you any dates. Hey, it might, dude. You might find that one. You're ch that's able, right. You, know. you, you might find that one philosopher, babe. Who knows? You never know. Sorry. Cool. Awesome. Well, should we open in prayer? Yeah. yeah let's do, let's it. do it. Lord, thank you so much for these awesome minds that get together, that speak about things that we don't have the time to think about so in depth and give us the ability to comment on them. Thank you for these brothers today and our lives and our wakefulness and these beautiful bodies and the audience out there. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we picked out a few clips that we thought were kind of key in this conversation. So uh, we'll just start with the first clip at C736. We would not treasure or cherish if we didn't have that inheritance. Once you accept that, then there's this question of, is that society you have able to sustain itself? Are the things you love able to sustain themselves and be replenished without reference to the thing that gave them birth? Um, put it another way, uh, let's say we're sitting on a branch. Uh, does the branch remain up if the roots of the tree are not nurtured? And that, putting it that way, of course, makes the answer rather obvious, which is, um, well, obviously not. I mean, if you use the branch of the tree analogy, obviously <laughs> that doesn't work. That's like sawing off the branch that you're sitting on. But then that poses a, a further question. And I, I addressed this a bit in the book you referred to there, um, Jordan, The Strange Death of Europe. There are a number of chapters I, I use in that book, which is about movement of peoples in the 21st century, the ease of movement, migration, and many other difficult questions. But the part of the book, which uh, at least um, I, I think is, is the most significant, in my, if I say so myself, is, is the portion on what I describe as a state of, of, of Western man's belief in the 21st century. Uh, um, that, we, that, that, that history has happened, discoveries have happened, Biblical criticism has happened, Darwin has happened, science has happened, discoveries have happened, the, the, uh, um, the, 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 the way in which we used to explain things we didn't know by putting God in there has increasingly been narrowed so that increasingly we know through science and discoveries how are certain things in our universe happen. Good. So I chose this clip because... 
Well, Murray's written a couple of books. I think his latest one is like The Death of Western. It's The Strange Death of Europe, I think. And then The Madness of Crowds. Right. And then he did something about Western, di- Western civilization dying or something right now or something of that nature. I'm butchering it. But um, he goes and describes the westernized Western civilization being rooted in Judeo Christian values and um, that being the tree. And then he goes further into science and sort of where we've come now to where we don't answer a lot of these questions with God. We use them. We we have actual answers for a lot of these questions now. And then he says, like, do the question is, is like, can the civilization persist and survive without that fundamental um, that foundation foundation of like some kind of belief system, which is Judeo-Christian, which he does elaborate on. So I thought that was kind of a a good one because it leads me, it it reminds me of this um, John Adams quote, which I also am going to (laughs) butcher, but pretty much John Adams says, this country was made for people, for religious people, pretty much. And um, if it won't work with, with anyone else, like you have to have respect for the Constitution. You have to have respect for God. You have to have some inherent like, got like there's got to be someone upstairs pretty much you gotta have reverence. watching what you're doing in the dark otherwise this country's not going to work mm-hmm. um and, and it kind of reminded me of that idea of john uh, john adams you know making this country and thinking it in the future he's like yeah this probably wouldn't work if for savages you know <laughs> like it's just not going to work you know you can give them everything in the world good but they're probably just going to mistreat it right you know well i think you you get a lot of guys like him appreciating judeo-christian values even though they don't think the source of them is truth and you know that's where the problem kind of comes in with my mind it's like just because something leads to a good like the what should matter is the truth of it not if the the end result is good you know in terms of their metrics of good because then it's just kind of it's still subjective in the end Uh you know what if communism produced great societies then it'd be a preference for it. Yeah, then we'd have a preference for it. But is it is it leading to truth in the end? Like, if is the fact that communism doesn't allow even religion, the concept of God, like, would you still want that society? Well, I mean, in mathematics, don't they, when you get into more obscure or, like, you know, crazy mathematics, they suggest solutions. That's actually the way that they, I didn't know this, but, like, you know, I grew up with algebra. I took algebra, two in high school, and... You know, you you carry on the process and you find out the solution. That's not the way they do it when they're dealing with like high versions of math. They oh, actually yeah. they have solutions that they actually yeah, when try doing, and when I was suggest. Doing, right? I was a math nerd, so you'd okay. actually get the result first, and you got they care about how you, they want you right. to show how you got to the. Well, solution. there's better solutions, and then there's like the solu- like Stephen Hawking had two solutions that he really liked for I guess one of his equations. I forget, um, and they had arbitrary numbers that they'd put in, Mm -hmm. you know, like little stops, certain things, boundaries. But I think what happens is that that solution is what we're looking for. When we look at the Western society is how good did it work? Well, the solution is there. We see, you know, years, hundreds of years of people have living in the best state sort of circumstance that we've ever seen. And why did that happen? What's the main purpose? Why? What what made this was a Judeo Christian backbone, and I mean we came from England, right? Mm-hmm. Why didn't it work the greatest over there? Why was why why they have to come all the way to the North Americas because they're looking for a better version, right? They're still building on that. We're always still building on that. So mm-hmm. like one of my critiques is for the people who are critiquing Western civilization is like we're still building on what Western civilization should be. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't stop. You know, and have this cliche of what it is, and so, then just it's like leave even it though at they that. started the country with the right foundation in many, or probably the best foundation from a country standpoint with the Constitution, they still messed it up in having slaves yeah. and like all. The, yeah, they, sure. they still had to evolve and improve. Yeah, it's an iterative process. You know, and there's so always far, something to good. to do. Well, I think the central, I think what really it describes is what love is, right? And so the epitome of all words is love. And that needs a really good description. That's why we have the Bible to describe it, right? And so, like, if you have a government that's going to try and soak up all that information so that people can have liberty, rights, all that stuff, freedom, you know, that's going to be a serious undertaking. So I pulled up the quote um, for John Adams. 
and this is what he said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Which I thought was pretty profound. I mean, because like you can we give like you could give like an iPhone to like some Nigerian or like somebody who doesn't know it's not going to do anything for them. Yeah, they should be like, give me some food. Like this thing is not going to. But you could give it to someone who knows how to use it, and they could, you know, make a business, well, do democ- all kinds of stuff, do, connect to the world. Even though we have a, we don't have a direct democracy, but democracy like it can just degenerate into mob rule in the end. If uh, and I think. I don't know who it was. I remember this long ago on a podcast. They were talking about democracy and civilization. It was the sociologist studying it was like a society needs like an average IQ of 90 or above to really have democracy start to work. So if you have a society that's still below that, it leads to problems. Yeah, people need to be able to interpret concepts. Oh, Mm -hmm. freedom takes intelligence. Yeah. Number one, like freedom doesn't work. And it's not easy. And it's painful. So mm-hmm. it's, it's oftentimes easier to be told what to do than to have actual freedom. There's yeah, no doubt about history's that. History's proven that many times. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, to answer his question, I think that, like, the fundamental of having a God or a higher power is is absolutely imperative for anyone in a leadership role. And I think, like, our founding fathers, most of them being deists or Christians, um, and, and extracting the Constitution from a biblical, a lot of it from a very biblical perspective. Um, our law, you know, the way our our our, um, our branches of government are set up and the, the checks and balances, like, um, th- it's, it's very, very much like the purpose of having a higher power looking down on you as you lead is just so important. I think it's accountability it's because who knows what they're going to do if they, if you get all power, they say, what's that? Like f- what's all power or power corrupts. Compl- oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolute, absolute yeah. power corrupts. Absolutely. Right. That's it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's why it's so important to have a belief in place, especially for leaders. Because there's nothing that unites people in their common ethical pursuit, and that's their behavior and their perceptions. And so I'll let Jonathan comment on that a bit. If No, I think what you're saying is right on track. That is, one of the problems that happened in the story of Christianity is something like the Enlightenment and modernism, which is that as the world was moving towards this notion of mechanical causation and the interest in mechanical causation, there were, there be came to be a misunderstanding of the way that traditional Christians believe the world actually existed. And so there's a difference between the material causes and something like the vertical cause of something. And the vertical cause of something is exactly this hierarchy that Jordan is talking about. And I would push what Jordan is saying even further. That is, it does actually affect, to a certain extent, even the is, because we can't perceive an is without a hierarchy of attention and without a hierarchy of perception because the world is is indefinite in detail and in quantity. And so for even to be able to say this, to point to something to say that is already in this hierarchy of something we could call vertical causation. So this glass has millions and millions of aspects to it, but we nonetheless are able to see it as one. And the fact that we see it as one is a total mystery To scientists, they don't know how to account for it. They use words like emergence, and you could just use the word magic and it would be the same. It's like this jump into unity. That is... So they have this reality surrounded by a field of possibility, Mm -hmm. right? And so the object isn't just what it is. It's also a set of things that it could become with varying degrees of difficulty depending on your intent. So it's a combination of being and becoming. Could become a weapon, Mm -hmm. but it couldn't become a car. Right, right. So, so it, it, it has an identity, but it's also surrounded by a field of possibilities. That's a good way to right, talk about right, it. Right, 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 right. So the, 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 the point is that when we look at the way that the creation of the world is described in Genesis, it's, it's related to exactly to that. God creates something, sees it, and sees that it's good. And so there's this notion of apprehension of identities and realizing that those identities have to do with their the fact that they're bound up in a value judgment, even though it's not necessarily moral, it's just a value judgment about how good something is. Because if I see a glass, I am always asking, is it a good glass? Even if I don't do it consciously, necessarily, because I, have to, I, I know that it's there to grip and to drink from. And it's the same, even with like 
Even scientists are doing that because they have to focus their attention on something because they can't study everything at once. They have to decide, I'm going to study this and I'm going to, going to decide the reason why I study that and therefore I'm going to be able to identify the facts that fit with my theory and prove my theory. So even the scientist is moving, is moving in the, this type of perception of the world, even sometimes without realizing well, we it. Could, I'd like to make a comment on the scientific front too, and I really started to think about this after talking to Dr. Dawkins, and I suppose to some degree to Sam Harris too on the atheist front. And so uh, I know that as the death of God in the Nietzschean terms has progressed, we've lost faith in an increasing range of uh, underlying realities, and the first might be the deistic reality. But then what we've seen happening under the onslaught of postmodernist thought is that we're starting to lose faith in the idea of fact itself. And then I was thinking, well, what's the precondition for being a scientist? And I thought, well, in some sense, it's a deistic pre, there's deistic preconditions, because one of the things that characterizes scientists, and this includes people like Dawkins, who's a real scientist, is that the scientist presumes axiomatically that there's a transcendent realm outside the domain of epistemological theory. So if you have a scientific theory and you're a real scientist, you know that your theory, which is really what you see when you look at the world, you, you know that your theory is insufficient in comparison to the reality that transcends it. And so then as a scientist, what you try to do... There's like two things in there. You yeah. Know, when I saw Jonathan bring up the the glass, I see a lot of the times people of faith, you know, who come at, the, we have like apologetic guys out there who are very rational. Then we have like other folks in our family that are not as rationally based. They don't need all that stuff. You know, they see the glass and it holds water and it makes sense. You know, they see Christ's story and they have like more of an intuitive grasp to it and that's enough for them. Yeah. You know, and it's amazing because like, when you break things down and you break and you keep breaking them down, you can break them down infinitely. And that is like, it's so true because somehow we can lock our focus on what matters. And that to me, I love how he points that out because it is such a miracle because people could look at a glass and just see a piece of glass or they could see the water in the glass. And, you know, even when you use words, you know, people get a, they hopefully have a vague similarity of the definition so that we can communicate and this is a miracle in and of itself. You know, how does that happen? You know, we're so insulated in our own minds and our own hearts, yet there is this overarching similarity. People and, generally agree on those and things. And they do. That's There's why a cohesion there. There's a congruence. And it's amazing. But like he was saying, I think what Jordan's trying to say afterwards is like the scientist mind, you know, how he or she comes into the world and is taught to fractionalize things, to be more precise with, with thought, material, you know, where things are coming from. All of a sudden there's categorizing that just goes on and on. And that's what scientists have to do because they have to repeat things, right? It's not just a story. This is an equation, right? And so I have a lot of respect for them. and The world has, has so much gained from them because technology and all the stuff they give us. But that important sort of in, intuitive understanding of value when we meet an idea or a thing is definitely something that I feel like I feel like what they're saying is makes us human. You know, like it's that vertical defining uh, sort of higher the presence of deity that you can't well, explain I, I away. What Jonathan's pointing out too with the glass and like talking about they have to focus it's like they have they're making the value judgment like with choosing to focus on something in science there's an infinite amount of things to do mm -hmm. and, so juice and Merlo go, said attention is a moral choice yeah so where a scientist even someone like dawkins is putting his attention is essentially a moral choice mm -hmm. and they can pretend it's not but it frankly is and there's that moral underpinning of even why does truth matter mm -hmm. i think they right. bring that up later like you could have a could be why is our brain wired to think truth is what matters and yeah, yeah that. and there's like levels to that like they give out nobel peace prizes to people that generally they like they're doing something beneficial for for a broad spectrum of people and like it's going to benefit people relatively timely basis like 
they deserve this. Okay, they're living in a time they're going to benefit these people that are alive right now. But you also have these these humans that are in like let's say a, a higher level. They see further, like they're they're more visionary, and they're seeing truth in a much more like extended version. You know, and I think that's why Jordan likes so much of what, what was he saying the the stories the. Meta truths, meta truths, yeah, because they, they don't they explain themselves further down the line, and that's yeah. why those kind of stories are so powerful. Yeah, and that's why I think it's great yeah. where Jonathan brings up like um, Genesis, where like God creates something, and then he's like, and then it was good, and then he was like, he decided that it was good. He almost God was like, I'm going to create this, and I'm just going to see if I like it, and then if I like it, then we'll we'll co- we'll continue moving on. And that's exactly what humans do. That's exactly what we do all the time throughout life. Like if a child goes up, you know, his mom and dad direct him or her, and then he he finds choices through experience and empirical experiences is, is living it so often. Where you were saying like there's a lot of people that they don't have they they're just they're a different kind of breed. They don't need to know the why to to believe the is, so to speak. They can just be like, yeah, this is. I believe it. I don't need to know why or how. Or any of that stuff, kind of like that guy we talked to on the on the live feed on mm-hmm. IG. Remember, he's like, "I don't know why people need to know all this stuff to believe." Like, just God just folks. says it, just do it. And I was like, "That's cool for you. Some God people, bless some you, dude." But like, works. a lot of people like science. A lot of people like to know the why, and it just ends up building up what 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 is, which is ultimately God's creation. But you know, it's interesting those I two different like breeds the of humans. Part is like. It all can be reconciled and coalesced. It's just like making sure that the process is correct. So like you have to use science. You can use, you have to use all of these things to sort of build out what truth is, you know, but don't let science become the the determining factor, right? It's going to be God, like that's your determining factor because we'll all reach a point where you're going to have to be like that dude, right? Where the what's what was his name? You guys were hanging out with well, Zach. Like, Zach. Yeah. We, as believers, we're all going to reach a point where some scientist is going to be telling <clears> us <throat> this is the state, and it's going to come up against our faith hardcore. And you're going to have to be that crazy person where it's like, no, I reject this. Why? Because it confounds my faith. So it's going to happen, but it's like you I actually can't, don't it, think it will it happen. Means well, I don't think it will either. I don't think it will happen. Not <laughs> that it happens in reality. Because that's the whole point is reality is not scientific. Reality is supernatural. But we don't have the cognitive function to come up against a scientist if he's telling you it's one way and he has papers and he's went to mm-hmm. school and he has all these peer review. You know, you're going to look like an idiot. Yeah, and you're moment. not going to be able to come up against him. Even if you knew he was, even if you say, for instance, were able to, you know, go toe to toe with him. Good luck, man. You know, it's one theory against another. That's where your faith takes on. So, I mean, how many times in history have we seen this happen? Where, yeah, you know, science goes on like this almost religious masquerade, you know, then it keeps be brought back. Here's what it actually means. You know, this happens all the time. There's that ebb and flow, right? So that's where I see the glass, you know, as being such a cool thing for us to hold on to is because we do have a a meta truth, you know, and and within it, we have freedom. And that for me was a comforting thing. And I know what Jonathan was trying to describe. It's like, this is a miracle, guys. Think about that. You know, it could just be this abyss of, of, of you know, no definition. Well, it all comes down not. to, like, utility and what's good for you to survive with. Like, we're all asking, like he says, is this glass a good glass or a bad glass? Or, like, can I drink out of this pretty much is the question and not die from it. Like, will it have bacteria in there? Is, you know, what is it, clean water, dirty water? And we're constantly doing that throughout life through relationships. Is this person good for me? Is this person bad for me? Do I like the way they make me feel or do they actually bring something good well, to my well, life? Here's the thing, though, is like that question. That's that, right, that's that's that the scientist. hierarchy that he's well, that's, talking that's about. That's very much the scientist in us all because you could just look at a glass well, and Well, he also brought glass. Genesis and well, he's like, God wanna, Bill made something and asked. People are still trying to add value to it, right? So there's trying to use a mechanism, mostly science these days, to say whether it's good, better, great, perfect whatever that's what they're using otherwise it's just like i like a pink glass well is a pink glass better than a blue glass better than a purple glass uh it doesn't matter as much are you a girl are Are you you a boy right so you start getting into more of these like you know but anyway that's where i was like that's why science is so important to guys like this because they know that if they just well, have preference, it doesn't matter. This they have to be able to quantize preference and break it down into something that's actually shareable and repeatable. And that's why I respect it so much. 
mm-hmm. challenge both for the religious and the non-religious in the discussion that we're heading towards. The, the, the first is a challenge for the non-religious, and that's to do with something that Jordan's already talked about, which is the area of ethics and shared values and, and, and much more. A, a great challenge for the non-believers in our age is, is that issue of where the values come from. And, and as Jordan's already suggested, uh, for instance, the Enlightenment, the idea of rationalism, soul rationalism, which not all Enlightenment thinkers would, were dealing with, but many were, the idea of rationalism being the sole way in which to discern ethics seems to me not to have been embedded very wide or very deep and may suggest that it's just not possible as a project. So, uh, to, to, to uh, quote my late friend Rabbi Jonathan Sachs on this, the idea that, that ethics are self-evident is self-evidently wrong. Um, so let me throw that out first as, as a challenge for the, for the non-believer. But then the challenge for the believer comes down to this thing that Jordan's also already dealt in, which is the issue of, let's say, myth or story. Because we might agree, for instance, that we need a, a, a story to agree upon or a myth to agree upon or a, a, a set of ideas to, re, to, to rely upon and to ground ourselves in. And that doesn't necessarily, of course, by any means lead to the, to, to the fact that those things are also true. We get into the realm of what uh, Schopenhauer and the dialogue on religion, which always made a huge impression on me, deals in, where he says, of course, he, what he describes as the tragedy of the clergy. That the tragedy of the clergy is that they know the necessity of the thing, they know the truthfulness of the story in a certain sense of truthfulness, but could never admit, or their job would be over, that that's what it is. In other words, they have to continue to deal in it as if this is not simply story or unifying myth or anything like that, but is something which has a truth claim behind it. And then let me just say one other thing on that, which is this, the issue of unifying ethic, because it, it must... I think that's, I think you get the point there. So you've got two things that the not like the non-believer part is, is spot on because they don't have, like you can't rationalize or come to objective moral conclusions with ethics and that's you know the whole problem with the atheist worldview is it kind of just leads to nihilism everything is kind of an illusion as far as ethics and you know they have to contend with that and they really haven't solved that problem yeah no they haven't yeah you just go off of uh 48 rules of power and and carry on yeah because ultimately that's what it is it's how mm -hmm. how do you accumulate as much wealth as much power in this life before you die and then that's the end game and that doesn't mean ethics or morals that means you're playing the game which the game has everything to do with deception and you know and getting what you want out of people without them knowing it And, and doing everything in your realm to benefit yourself it's and your end goal, which is ultimately non-ethical and amoral. And they would that's where I mean, Ayn Rand comes in and yourself. tries to rationalize it with what does she say? Like selfish selfishness is a virtue oh in her one book. And say, and they'll you'll say like if everyone lives in their own self interest, it actually builds up in society in general. And it's like that's their it's current ad ran. That, I mean, mean, that's exactly that is her book. Well, it I is. think that the okay. issue that yeah. when I see what I see happening here is like how many examples of people following what you describe to their end have people just horrible experience with life. They're not happy, right? We see that happen all the time. But the truth is that we as Christians, we're selfish too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like we're <clears> operating course, yeah. out of this. You know. Uh, self sac we try to but there's not we just know it's the best thing there still is reward in it you know so we're just doing it for the right reasons well selfishness can when, take on any type of character like well, you could say mother really teresa about, was selfish because she did all those things because she said she's making treasures in heaven or she's there's a sorry. lot of this type of idea that selfishness can take on any type of facade really and, and, and very twisted ones and if you go delve into the far dark corners of psychology every time there's all kinds of yeah. different ways to be selfish there's for sure well that's what i'm saying yes. is it's always out of self-interest we believe in christ because it's the truth 
I don't believe in Christ because it's obscure, stupid, and might hurt me and everybody around me, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is that people do believe in stuff like that, like true, they think that by screwing over people and being selfish and greedy in the worldly way will somehow give them happiness, even though they see the evidence before them. They have this insanity embedded within them where they'll still try and do that. So, I mean, it's present, man, where that... People think they'll be. That's that arrogance that I well, see. Well, they rationalize it all. They ra- Just even, of course, Hitler why not? rationalized. But is it really why rational? not rationalize? That's it the whole point. Is if it you think really about rational? it, a lot of times you'll be able to take care of your family. You'll give me. You're going to be able to meet your needs. You're going to be able to get that woman that you like. You're going to be able to get that house. You're going to be able to live that lifestyle that you that you have. Well, in America, we really are very materialistic. So it comes down to actual items. You know, material things. You're going to be able to have those things. But then at the end of the day, you find, does this actually bring joy and happiness and fulfillment and purpose to my life? The purpose is to play the game to get more things. And after you've gotten so many things, eventually you're just like, okay, like when does this thing kind of like, when is there a purpose? When do I transcend this, the getting of things? And then you get into like power and then you get into more depraved sorts of ways of, 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 of gaining this sort of purpose, which fundamentally leaves them more and more farther away from what God's written on most of our hearts, I like to believe, which is, you know, giving something of benefit back to the people around you. Having something that you present to the community and to the world that's like, well, everyone's going to benefit from this. And that comes back to the Nobel Prizes. This comes back to, you know, Gandhi or, or MLK or any of these guys that have done good things. Is We tend to remember those guys and not demonize them as much as like our Genghis Khans or like some of these other, you know, people power that figures. are just yeah. power figures. That's all they That's all they did. Well, you, you know, know, kind of touching base back on what uh, Murray's trying to point out is that These ethics that we have, you can live in this world and enjoy the fruit of what men have done, what God has put here in the West, which is a wonderful, wonderful, um, we can live in a way that not a lot of people have in history. And people will still not ask the question of where these things have come from. And some of these things that we're talking about are ethics, um, morals, and how we have preference on what to pick. You know, it's like, People need to be handled in a certain way for them to thrive, right? Like you were saying, if somebody has a choice, I'm going to live a life where I'm going to be greedy, self-serving, basically a sociopath, or I'm going to be self-sacrificing and try and look out for my fellow man. Most CEOs are sociopaths. Yeah. Just putting that out there. I'm aware of that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm aware of that. That's why why capitalism can go down a very bad... Most leaders tend to go that way, too. You know, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, right? What I'm trying to say is that when somebody has, everybody's faced with that choice, and you have to be thoughtful and ask yourself, why do I have a preference towards good, and what is manufacturing that description of good for me? You know, is it just a law? You know, like, is it just something that some guy is saying? Mm -hmm. You know, where is it actually coming from? And that's why I think it's very good that Douglas Murray is saying, guys, Look, we are living in in this evidence right now that the West has uh, the possibility for the greatest life you can have right at this point in time, so far as history has been able to prove. Where does that come from? You guys, where does it come from? Right? So I think it's a good question for people to think about, to have self-respect for the country you live in, place you are from. Yeah, and um, two things I wanted to bring up. One was at the end of uh, Brave New World, or no, 1984, there was a, I forget, some kind of like, th- I forget who it was written by, but, but he talks about um, about sales, sales, and salesmen or women, how they will get a product, and they will say this is the best product for you. But really what they're saying is this is the best product for me to sell to you. It's it's not about the product actually benefiting the person. And that's what so much of sales in this world has become nowadays um, is, is that sort of like lack of integrity within like what your motive is and using all these different tools to kind of gain attention. I've always been leery of sales. I've always been. And I think everybody has good reason to know that because they've been sold on stuff and they've seen themselves get sucked into it. But you don't want to get sucked into bad philosophy. And that's why you need to ask the right questions, you know, because if, if somebody's uh, in, a, in a very 
this poor state, like, in, and I mean poor state in the way that they're they're dealing with their philosophies, like uh, California or you know New York. These people are operating in a freedom space, right? Because the space has been made free, and they are they're like a really spoiled kid who's messing up the house. And when mom and dad come home, they're going to set things straight. But they don't know how bad they're messing it up because they're living in this place of freedom. And so they're taking that sales pitch from the enemy, the devil, and they're just like, you know, eating all these corn dogs. Hedonism. And ice. It's hedonism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I do think that that's such a good question to continually ask yourself. How do we, how do how we about the next part of that, right? though, is yeah. challenge back at us? Yeah. And right. I wanted to kind of get into and that. How did he phrase I that? I wanted to. Well, he, he kind of was I like, why, why do you, basically saying like what you believe in your religion, being it a truth, is it truth? And why is it truth? Like, is that what he said? Can we watch that little segment again? Because I don't remember how he said it. Myth or story. Because we might agree, for instance, that we need a, a, a story to agree upon or a myth to agree upon or a, a, a set of ideas to, re, to, to rely upon and to ground ourselves in. And that doesn't necessarily, of course, by any means lead to the, to, to the fact that those things are also true. We get into the realm of what uh, Schopenhauer and the dialogue on religion, which always made a huge impression on me, deals in, where he says, of course, he, what he describes as the tragedy of the clergy. That the tragedy of the clergy is that they know the necessity of the thing, they know the truthfulness of the story in a certain sense of truthfulness, but could never admit, or their job would be over, that that's what it is. In other words, they have to continue to deal in it as if this is not simply story. Basically, I keep the facade going because it's working. Yeah, And I mean, well, that's what he says in the beginning, too, because he's like, I, you know, yeah. believe the story like 99%, but the actual truth of like the resurrection, which is what also Jordan has a problem with, they're like, Too much. they step back from. And it's, Craziness. <laughs> and then so, I mean, he's correct. If the story is not true, then it's kind of a facade and everyone's trying to keep it going because it's working. Hmm. You know, and, and I, I, I know that, and I remember a statistic coming up where it, I forget, it was a r appalling number of ministers who get up on the pulpit and they don't believe it. You know, they carry out the action. They just do it. It's a job, mm -hmm. you know. And it made me really sad because I was like, it's like that sales pitch thing. It's like, you know, you were talking about when the preacher cries, you know, pulling these heartstrings and this little recipe that people use to make people feel very sensitive and then open and then they insert the blank with whatever they want you know and it's very it's a, it's like man people well, people can be in that delicate place and then and they know how to get them there and they use it as a tool you know i was thinking of how many sermons are, are like basically advice or ted talks yeah that they like then so they like i want to provide advice to these people on this topic and then they just go find some Bible verses that are out of context to fit the <laughs> fit the narrative they're trying to say. Yep. And in the end, it makes people feel good, and might, they might leave with some good advice. But it's like, okay. and that's the danger of it. It's like you could to... you could have pulled probably all the Bible verses out of that and put it on a TEDx talk, and it would have been the same thing. Yeah, and that would be like Jesus saying, "You know what? I'm not going to tell them to drink my blood and eat my flesh. We'll just leave that out." You know. But he didn't. He said, and the disciples are like, "That's a hard teaching." He lost a lot of disciples. You know, so we need to be prepared for that. We need to judge what we're taking in, not by how it makes us feel, uh, period. But what I do know when I hear about the clergy, his idea of the clergy, is that uh, there's a certain arrogance that takes form in men who are able to do what I just described. Um, it's they power, know dude. that it's power, it's but power. they know they can influence people's. This is what I'm getting at here is they know that they can change people's minds and give them a belief set. And so what happens is after doing that for a while, they think it's all just some guy in the background doing that, just find out how far back it happened. There is no God if men can do this to other men. There's no supernatural thing happening here. It's just me knowing how to push these buttons and voila. So it causes doubt. Because they put themselves in the seat of God. They're no longer realizing that this is a, a mission of, of service. And so I see that, and I know that's how... And then I can also see that they can say, well, if I'm doing the best, and this is how it's like, man, that's scary, because this guy actually is kind of being a good guy. 
You know, he's like, I'll stay here and do this because these people need this and I'm not going to give them bad stuff, but I don't believe it. Like, that's just so broken, you know, and it's the same question I had for Jordan. It's like, well, if the if it, if the gift of Christ's life is manifest in the, in the West and we see it, and we're all saying let's glorify the West for this freedom that's been given us, but we can't digest a miracle when that in itself is a miracle then what gives? It's kind of the same thing Jesus is like, if you can't forgive your brother, then God can't forgive you. Why? Because you haven't put your faith in God enough to forgive you, because you haven't even seen yourself in the place where you're getting forgiveness, because you don't know how bad you are. So you can't forgive somebody else? It doesn't work that way. You haven't accepted God yet. Otherwise, you'd be able to forgive. So, you know, where's the miracles? The miracles and the freedom that we live right now. Well, I think in it's today, not only in the resurrection, right? It's not only in the resurrection. I think in like today's world, um, like every every echelon, I don't know if I'm using that word right, but every time in in history, there's like there's a battle. There's there's these like society. There's this, these um these cultural like issues going on you know before like in the dark ages the church was like clamping down science and then science you know in the modernist materialist age was like you know get church out of this thing and now they're kind of like we can bring them both together um as they're talking about the glass and sort of the idea within like even coming up with a theory like how does that even happen like you have to it doesn't happen from the scientific method it happens through through when you're having a couple beers with your friends at a bar one night, and then you know an idea comes. You know or you're having you're in this more this fluid state, um, and then these ideas and these theories come into light. And like in today's world, like we're always trying to to like rectify like truth from from like what he would call like magic. You know what I mean? Like myth. what's what's magic or what's myth? More like magic. Because, like, I kind of think, like, the sexes, like, what's going on, like, is it a woman, is it a man, is it both? Like, what's kind of going on here? Like, this is more of, like, an identifying factor within someone's psyche, but they're trying to change their actual bodies to align with it, you know? Or, like, we're going, there's a couple issues like that kind of going on where people want to have, like, their cake and eat it and be like, this is okay. Like, this is this is going to work and this is all right. And um, it's like we have we have to kind of be able to, to to size up like what the actual issue is like what what's going on these are identity crises that are going on people don't feel like they're they're identified properly you know which is a heartbreaking thing to think about because like these people honestly feel like they are not who they are who God made them to be and um they're getting answers to where this type of their answers and the the way that they get to their answers is bleeding into all kinds of other things you know, within, within what we're doing in, in this world today. So it's like, there's certain, like, there's certain stories or myths, like Jordan says, that make more sense than others. And like when, 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 um, when, what's his name? Murray was kind of like challenging us. I was thinking like, okay, why Christianity? Like, what, what does that have to offer? Well, uh, being somebody who's going to be rational or tries to be rational, <laughs> I would look at the societies that have done the best and what they used, and that generally is a Judeo-Christian foundation for what they've done. You look at, like, the Muslims and Sri Lanka, like, what they've been able to do. It's about look at the Hindus. Who's um, look at some of the other, um, the Buddhists, and, like, they're they're pretty good. They all have a good thing to bring. Like, they all have something really wonderful about each one of the religions um, that they focus on that's beautiful. But as far as, like, you were talking about, like, a, like a, like a cumulative cultural like something that benefits pretty much everybody and that really boosts society i think christianity probably is at the forefront judging oh, by the is. countries that are doing the best that have the best laws that have the best medical that have the best education that when you're 25 like what where are you at in the world just given just by where you were born you know, just by where you were born. Yeah. So I think um, they, that's why I would say that. Yeah. You know, I would I would choose next, that even if I wasn't rash like a yeah. Christian or anything. Well, that's what Douglas like, Murray why? chose. Well, and I think this said. next clip is going to say that exactly why. I think he talks about why we view in humans as being intrinsically valued, and that's Let's unique to Christianity. 
something to the same category. Yeah, but let me let me let me let me leap in there with something else. I, I, I would go a level beneath that, which is which is something which I think we could agree on, which the Enlightenment thinkers were were, were dealing in, and the religious are dealing, which is is a, is a much more important issue than mere issues of nationhood or belonging, which is are we beings with value? Yeah, now, that's for sure. They're very important. That that of course historically. Uh, is 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 not the case. Uh, most empires in history, in, in the ancient world, and much more saw saw most people as having no value. W- one of the revelations, obviously, I use the term in a certain degree of quotation mark, but one of the revelations of the Christian tradition is the idea that everybody does have intrinsic value. And we've all grown up and everyone after, everyone during the Enlightenment is dealing in those terms. They're trying to extend, if anything, the idea of Christian value. And there are some Christian theologians who say the very idea of where we are now is in a sense an embodiment of the Christian tradition, which is in the tradition of human rights law and much more. We accept it like fish accept water that people have value. But that, of course, as we know, we can look around the world today to other places and other parts of the world, and we realize that there are still parts of the world where, where people do not have any value and their lives are regarded as valueless, and that, and that isn't even regarded as being a, a tragedy in the way that we would regard it. So, so the idea that, that, that we're beings with value is something that has been so deeply built into our our, our, our sense as a society, they don't even realize that this is what we're swimming in now. Obviously, that comes from the, from, from the Christian tradition. It comes from the idea that we're created in the image of God. Being, be, exactly. The, 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 I, I, uh, that right there sums I, up It does. Thing. It totally does. And like, I want to address the elephant in the room because like, I know a lot of people watching the podcast are not Christians and they probably see a lot of Christians putting one sin above another and like looking at the, the hierarchy within the Christianity of like, oh, you know, they don't like gays or they don't like, you know, other people of other religion. And there's a lot of that going on in the church. And that is not biblical because in the New Testament, they flipped it. They're like, he who is meek, he who is humble, he who is the least. And they really try to flip the dominance hierarchy, which or the power, power hierarchy. And I just wanted to kind of like say that that is not biblical, guys. And a lot of the way that like a lot of these churches and a lot of these Christians are out there trying to say who's best, who's not, according to what sins that they have trouble dealing with is complete BS, and um, it's got nothing to do with with what's in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. I mean, it's it's going contrary to everybody being made in God's image is what it's doing. You know, and that means the sinner. And I think that human beings, they like to, they like to make nicknames for people. They like to characterize people, make caricatures of them. And we do that with sin. You know, if you see somebody who's got an issue with gambling or is gay, you know, or has, uh, you know, any other kind of issue going on, we have this tendency. It's it's a habit deeply ingrained in us to sort of put that sin over who they are, you know, and then you get a caricature. You get this sort of thing. And Christ asks us not to do that. He asks mm-hmm. us to divorce the sin from the person, hate the sin, not the person, and try and, and love that person instead of hating them. Well, I think and, when you see societies that are doing horrific atrocities, you think of like Nazi Germany. They had for humans to like be able to do that kind of stuff. They have to dehumanize that people group. That's like, right to be subhuman. It's a process. So isn't like it? it's so ingrained in us that if it's a fellow human in our minds, like we can't do that stuff. So we have to rationalize somehow that person is a, not a human essentially, and then we can go do that stuff. To which them. would be sin. Which mm-hmm, would be the exactly. easiest way to, oh, he's gay, or oh, she's she's got a problem with, like, promiscuity, or whatever it is, which seems to be, like, the most common ones are, like, people have, like, either lust well, the, or sex problems. I wouldn't say, I mean, that doesn't necessarily happen for, like, people are going to ju- be judgmental about the sin, but as far as, like, human atrocities, it's usually, like, on a people group or... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like a like discrimination a based or, off you know, of some right. kind of cultural yeah. element or race element. Like, I think even the... But, someone that's committing murders, they're, they're rationalizing in their head somehow that person's below. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, going back to what Douglas said, it is something that manifests itself miraculously out of a world that did not have that concept at all, mm-hmm. right? So the, the predominant concept are some people, 
are better than others. Animal farm. Well, right? even feudalism Some that was under the dark ages and that was Christianity. Or they were totally more equal down with it. than others. I forget how George Orwell said it, but it was great. <laughs> and um, animal farm reference. Uh, but what happens is when everybody's equal, everybody has the opportunity to do something, right? When you look at the caste systems in India, um, a lot of what Gandhi ran into were, were people who were, even the people who were subject to the worst form of the caste system, the lowest rung. Untouchables. Untouchables. He'd go and he'd try and say to these people, like, look, I have a heart for you. You guys are being persecuted. You know, and they would say, no, this is right. I need, you know, they're so indoctrinated, so incredibly molded into this that the, the, the people, it's the identity. very people, right, the very people that he was trying to save, they were unwilling. Um, and so what you start to realize is that freedom is, it's a scary thing to them. Like when they were, so For sure. you don't have to live in this caste system. It's like John Savage. They were afraid, yeah, they were afraid of knowing afraid what it would be like to, uh, be that person in a car, you know, or living in a nice house. It, it was too much. Way so, too much. Way too much. And you see how deep that fear, because it's really fear, because fear of freedom is what, that's what they use against the person. Fear of freedom is saying you are not worth it. That's what Satan, the accusers, same tactic he uses, right? You're not good enough. You're not good enough. This is why. You won't ever be good enough, right? And so... Don't even try. When, when people live in a world like the West where everybody's intrinsic value is the same, which it's not. So let's just be real with that. In the United States, it's not. When we're in high school and middle school, you could do anything. It's like, not really. Okay. You can dream about stuff and be the best, and you could. It's just not the way it works. It's a nice idea I'm about Fight Club. We but all we're thought the, we were going to be for sure. Yeah, exactly. But we're closer we're to that. Off. But we're and I'm not going to be the guy to say we're liars. I'm going to say, well, at least we're closer to it. And you do have to tell the kids that, so that each preceding generation we get closer to that, right? Because the more a kid will believe that, the more he's going to teach it to his kids. The more hopefully that'll prevail on the nation. But we're not there yet, you know. And so like. People in the West, they're entitled to that freedom, but it's also the negative backlash of that, which is what I was saying in California and New York we're seeing, where they're using that freedom without vetting out the foundation, or they're not pushing it through the filter of what gave it their fil- for their freedom already. Talking about the tree and the roots, we talked about this earlier The tree on. and the roots, they're cutting, the, they're cutting the, the branch that they're sitting on off. But uh, So as I reflect on intrinsic value... Uh, I don't know how many days it go past where I don't think about it enough, but it is one of the exercises we should all use as believers to try and give you some of the, if you, if you have an issue with grace or mercy or just patience with people, I know I do. You know, you think about God say, Hey, this is one of his sons. This is one of his daughters are made in his image. Uh, it's an exercise, right? Yeah, so I think we it's live an exercise it, we, for yeah, a lot really, of Christians to try and do to because do, it's so easy do. to get stuck in it's your church. It's easy to say it. It's so easy to parrot off the same things, to go do the same exact little you know, axioms that your church p- pounds off. And it's like, you're not really doing anything with no. that that's like productive. It's like you're just doing the same thing that so-and-so is doing, your pastor's doing, or someone else is doing. There's nothing really like really true within your relationship with Christ there going on. There's nothing novel. There's nothing well, there's, to be Well, there's wolves out there, you know, and I know that if you're a shrewd Christian, you got a little bit of that Jew in there, you know, like you know that people are going to take advantage of you. They're going to try to take advantage of you, you know, and you, you have that in the background of your mind, and you're also like, well, I got to treat people. with. It's a very hard thing. That's why I say it's an exercise because somebody might come up to you and you want to treat them nicely. They just, you know, clean your clock. Totally. You know, and that happens to Christians all the time. Be wise, you know, serpents and gentle as doves. That's it's, exactly where I was going to go. It's a with tough it. thing to do. So and, that's how you mm. find that that uh, equipoise, like you'd said, to have judgment and discernment. So because it's not something I you think can the, easily the live. Quality thing and the value is like like Mike was saying. It comes down to like fundamentals. Like, do you kill this person, or do you give, or do you not? You know what I mean. And in the church, it mostly comes down to how you talk about sin and people which is what I was kind of relating to the elephant in the room because I know a lot of people that know me, they'll see the podcast and they'll be like, oh, they'll just immediately write me off as being some type of person, you know, automatically like, oh, 
Joe's. But we kind of all person. encounter that. It's normal. Yeah. Um, and so that type of person that I'm getting written off as is the type of, you know, the Christians that are your stereotypical cliches. And that is definitely not what I am, which is why dating for me is so hard because it's like, I, do you, do you want to find a person that's straight out of the church? Do you want to find a person? It's like, neither. You know what I want? I want a, like an authentic human being. And that's what's what we run into so often. And that's why like giving intrinsic value to people and knowing like how to discern through that and putting that effort into it is really what, what Christ does for everybody. And that's the idea behind like what Christ does for everybody mm-hmm. and his sacrifice for people that didn't even know him or care about him. Um, being in an ultimate power position and doing that, um, bringing himself low. Uh, as a Christian, it's like, that's what I want people to be known more as, um, instead of like this judgmental, like, you know, Bible thumping, very closed off, you know, type of person that, um, I think so many of us are not, you know, but that's really what we fight, what we kind of go up to is like this judgmental stereotype. A lot of cliches, a lot of, a lot of scar tissue. Lots of that. And especially with the Western, you know, I notice it with like the youth in, in, in America, you know, a lot of these kids and they're just turned off by it. They're just like, I don't want anything to do with that. And I can kind of see why, because it seems dead to them. It seems dead. It seems like there's no life well, in there. Well, you also have to know that, and we all know this, when you're a kid, you're going to make excuses because of what you want to do. I was going to say, there, yeah. there's they a got, big draw to hedonism. It's and, big. And, and I they knew, know, without even having to go to church, what the boundaries are yeah, in Christianity. No one wants to play by those rules. So this is a heavy bias. Heavy. I wouldn't even say, it's, it's more of just... Let me go do what I want to do. Well, to be but, fair, there are some things. I wouldn't say that's 100%. To be dude, fair, there's an there exploration. There is no 100%, but I will say that most kids in the, in the in the West, without the amount of freedoms they have, they want to go do them, man. That's It takes a very unique circumstance of God touching them to say, I don't want to do all this worldly stuff while they all go do it, and I'm the guy not doing it. Yeah. We're we're experiencing that with a guy, and I was kind of that way when I wasn't a Christian. When I went through like my new age, when I went through like all these things, I didn't just go out and let the door open and just say, you know what, whatever. I'm just gonna go bang a bunch of chicks and just go out and you know do whatever and plow. Maybe you know. not the maybe not the just, sex. I'm not but we, saying I know that's... I knew you during that time. We were doing plenty of other things that would have yeah. that would have been we experimented with all drugs, kinds of things, all yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like we were putting it through. But moral, once again, I don't think you know, morals funny. went straight out the door because of that. That's all I'm saying. No, they could never though. That's yeah. what people realize is is the morals never go straight out the door, and the more that hedonism they draw into that, the more those morals that are left behind are starting to just grab them and pull them back because they don't feel good anymore. Like they, It's almost like they just ran out of all that goodness, and then there's just none left, and they feel like Oscar Wilde. They're like, he has this quote, God will grant the prayers to those when he wants to teach them a lesson. <laughs> He'll answer their prayers when he <laughs> wants to teach them a lesson. Basically, he'll give you everything you want and yeah. you're praying for to show that you don't know what's good for you. Well, yeah, part, so, of, part of that reminds me of, I won't say his name at this point because we'll probably have him on and let him tell the full, but a guy in our group uh, who's in college uh, who's kind of recently, I'd say, woken up mm. from a very liberal and atheistic environment in school, and he basically now realized I, to maintain the friendships he's had, he has to pretend. Like to kind of buy into all their create like everyone's switching their genders, so taking brutal. girls are taking testosterone, guys are all confused as well, and he's like everyone's depressed. There's a massive hookup, <laughs> that's, that's you know, hookup thing, culture, right. and it's like he's they're like aggressive. if I if they're I, aggressive, depressed, they're shaming him, and angry. It's for, like oh my gosh, yeah, and they're shaming him for even like talking to us. Like the fact that we he goes to the gym with us, like he gets shamed up for, and so like they're like if you try to try to present the gospel in that scenario, mm-hmm. like it's just not going to well, be. What's received. the common denominator though? Like we see that nasty way of shunning and that sort of what would you call it? You know, it's it's trying to shame somebody it's to your come views back don't right? align with mine so i don't like you as a person which is exactly right. what a lot of the christians so we do see the church do in that the church we and see, outside the church so we shouldn't be doing the same thing they do it's just people man it's not the i'm not church. saying i'm not saying it's, it's not, not just people well, I'm, I'm saying i'm this saying is, let's recognize it for what, what he it just is. said is what a lot of people encounter with christians so i'm just That's, drawing that parallel so right now. i was drawing that parallel i was saying we see it in church we see it in the in the colleges this is something that humans do 
It doesn't matter if God's in the background. I think or, Christian, or Christians not, should not, do it to so. each other. Well, well, we're supposed to co- keep each point. other accountable, um, which is kind of, it's like different. It's like you're loving your brother, you're loving your sister, you're like, hey, you know, I want to help sometimes you out. Sometimes they're chastised, sometimes you're kicking them out of the church. Yeah. You know, sometimes you are, and those pretty extreme circumstances, and you're probably dealing with some sociopath or some kind of crazy dude that's like really wants power. The, that's, that's like the jacked. Thing, it happens. It and that's why it's addressed. But I mean, I'm just more talking friendships and like you were talking about. The other about. part he, was br- he brought up too, which is kind of interesting. So they're all about tolerance in the right area. <laughs> in the and right but area. Then, then he, the he right. picked one of the bad he's, boxes. He's explaining to me how they like kind of nothing is off bounds and it's kind of like they, they push yeah. each other off into like just digging in deeper and deeper pits so there's not it's not like oh my you're depressed and there's all these obvious reasons why it's more like you're okay the way you are we'll just get you some more depression meds try this out maybe you, should, maybe, you know maybe it's time to try some estrogen out like they <laughs> they basically promote bad ideas when people are in bad places mentally like more they, and more they just extreme. more and more like just and it's there's never accountability or like we encourage you to improve in this area. It's normally like you, you're the you're okay the way you are. It Don't. seems like they're addicted to like extremities within like what they can do. Like that's what they view freedom as. It's like you're gonna feel better also, if you stand I, so I, far out. Like you know, becoming it's an a woman identity thing. They it, like it want is. attention, and they yeah, it's they like want, how jacked can you get your identity? I don't get what I don't understand is like. How do they answer when it's all okay? You know, if it's, there is no answer, there isn't, that's why that's, they're always but like, the, "Try this." But isn't now. it obvious that that's the reason why they're never going to feel okay? Because there isn't, you know, they're yeah, never going to feel you know, comfortable. Like that to me would be the. I would recognize. I don't know. Maybe I'm older now, but I'd say, well, if it does, if nobody has some baseline homeostasis, something where it's solid where we're all sort of pointing our aim at a bullseye, uh, what the heck? I, then why am I going to take your advice or his chemicals? Or What's the point then? And that's nihilism, and they do reach it. <sighs> and then, the then there's suicides because then the kids that don't have, you know, they see the other ones get attacked and defeathered. They don't want to do that, so they're not going to tell their friends how they really feel, and they keep it inside, and they thing you know, they're dead. A lot of yeah, them friends aren't happens. friends. Like, they don't know how to be friends. Like, I've noticed, like, some of this younger generation, like, their input to their friends is not super friendly. It's mm. more like, let me help you cut corners or let me help you. He, like, he I think, lost one of his friends. Like, one of these girls who uh, he's known from high school, he said, asked him for testosterone, like, thinking he would know where to get it because he's been going to the gym with us. <laughs> and he told her, honestly, like, like I don't think that's a great idea. Good, like, and he, I, that friendship sounds like it's probably over just for that opinion. Fragile, yeah. And like Joe was saying, real friendships. I think you need to read books to find out what these things mean, because you're not going to see them in ordinary life. If you read good books, you'll see what real friendship is. You'll see what it's like, and there's not a lot of it out there. I'll tell you what, it's highs and, and lows, and it's getting screwed over by the best person you know and still loving them, guys. The best guy you know just stabbing you right in the back, and you still moving forward with them and loving them and taking that time to not be like, this bridge is burned. <clears throat> no, you do the opposite, and that's what real friendships are forged on. It takes a lot of understanding and discernment of how to not burn that bridge but keep that relationship open and that takes a lot of experience and you should be having mentors and people that have had that experience help you out through those situations because you won't be able to do that by yourself but you certainly will feel like burning the whole thing down to the ground and that's definitely not the answer but it seems like in today's culture so many of us when we find something that we don't like or that doesn't fit in with what our narrative is and what we want we just we just burn it to the ground or we act like it doesn't exist or cut it out completely from our life, which is what we can get on the internet and on Instagram and all these social media resources is we can live in our own little bubble world. Okay. All these people agree with me. I don't have to find out people that don't agree with me. I don't have to contend with anybody that doesn't. I live in an echo chamber and this does nothing but stifle and create these extreme groups, which eventually these little bubbles are going to grow and grow and grow. And they're going to start Get hitting other bubbles and they're going to start conflicting and then you're going to have these bubbles burst and then well, a lot friendship. of people are going to not be able to understand how to communicate from a fundamental level because they're so there. used with people there. just agreeing with them and then you have the people like you're talking about with like this is 
I'm tolerant to everything, but your intolerance on this subject, you know? And it's like these half-baked cognitive dissonance into these ideas and what people are doing to where this is where we're entering into these meta meta truths and like we're gonna have to use stories like Jordan's saying. We're gonna have to start going back to these sort of principled stories that are meta Can I meta have to go truths. to the boring old stuff. You gotta Dust be fun. Yeah. <clears throat> Next clip. Look, How are you? Jonathan and I were talking about this last night, you know about because we just sat and did this long seminar on Exodus and you might ask well did did the events in Exodus really happen and our conclusion was well not only did they they happened in a in a meta manner they're still happening they happened so in, they happened with such reality that they haven't stopped happening and so and what does that mean well everyone still struggles with the spirit of tyranny and everyone still struggles with the fact that when you escape from a tyranny, you, you don't hit the promised land, you hit the desert. And then when you're in the desert of your imagination or with your lost peers, then you need to struggle with what guides you and what should guide you when you're lost. And then you have to grapple with the problem of appropriate and uh, uh, reliable forms of governance, because that's all part of the Exodus story. And so it didn't happen the way a happening would occur if you just detailed it out as a camera holding empirical observer. It happened in a way deeper way that just doesn't stop happening. So I think that that's, that for me, like for sure the fiction thing is a, is a difficulty for me, that category. But I, I, I can follow the process and understand this idea. So Basic outlining there's, meta truth. There's a few stories. things there that I feel like when somebody encounters the word of God, they may not see it upon reading it once <laughs> or twice, but it's the same story planned panned out for different people. You have Moses, you have at or you have Adam, you have Abraham, Moses, Joseph, uh Saul all these figures that are living this lifestyle and there's central points that align and they line up perfectly. And we call that typology in the Bible. Some people call it foreshadow, um, but specifically it's typology. And he talks about the more truth or the bit more like a more profound reality more true than truth. More true than truth, reality sends time and cultures and so, all that stuff. Stories. These things will also be present in our own lives. That's where we begin to integrate Bible wisdom, not just knowledge, into our own lives. That's what's blowing Jordan's mind when he looks at this book and says, well, what's the utility in it? Why the stories? Why the mythology? How does it cut like a razor when science can't cut like a razor? Why is it still the, the leading edge, you know? And it's because it's reliving through each one of us all the time. It's reliving through each generation well, science all the time. Is a, science is, it never deals stops. With, science deals with like a formula and an exact, an exact solution. These stories... They are, they're definitely not formulas or exact solutions. They are able to transcend a cultural, um, all the little tiny variables within a story that can change and make the story look different. So like instead of Exodus in a C, maybe it's not a C in your life. Maybe it's a financial problem in your life instead of the Red Sea. And you have to find a way to part this to get into the desert. Maybe the desert isn't the desert. It's your wife divorced you. You know what I mean? So like all these different parts of the story, they become different within the culture, within each person's story, so to speak. They're archetypes, they're archetypical. So I think that's what Jordan talks about when he means they're more truer than true because they not only apply to like one person well, or that's what another, I meant when I said you're they, living it yourself. They, they apply you to all to, kinds of you people. You have to be able to, to use uh, the tools of story, reading, interpreting mythology, interpreting truth. You have to use those tools, which means you're going to have to relate. And so if you can relate and use the symbolism of, like, what does a desert mean? What does it mean for me uh, to, to get out of bondage and then go through another desert? I have to redefine myself in a world where I was a slave. 
It's like the, the, the believer who finds Christ is immediately excited, but then it's like, well, here's all this hard work you have to do. You're becoming a new person. Then you enter into the land of, you know, milk and honey. It's given to you, but not without work. Not right, without, not without not annihilating faith. a couple people, men, annihilating women, sin, and children, baby. Annihilating sin. Total annihilating those things in your life that are going to bring you down. That's exactly what these this this uh, we, we learn to do. Otherwise, they're just things that are out of touch. It's just a history lesson or an idea of what the history was, somebody's perspective, but it's not just that. So um, reality, what is reality? Reality, when you look at some of the ancient cultures, they made gods out of things that persisted past a generation. So like every generation is going to feel wrath. So usually there is a god of wrath. Every generation is going to feel lust, right? Or partying, whatever. There's a god for that. War, same thing. So they made deities out of that because that was a transcending reality that was more profound than whatever a generation could say or could be, right? And so that's why these stories are like that. They're the overarching themes that no matter what generation you're from or what snapshot out of this history of humanity you are, they're present and they're there. Every piece of it is there. Yeah, Matt, we were talking about like how different the Old Testament is from the New Testament, like even Psalms. And like reading the Old Testament, I was like, man, there's a lot of like lying, deception, annihilation, complete like it's just it's a, it's gnarly, dude. It's a savage it's history, so lesson. savage, and it's like that would be like the Forty Eight Laws, like Tom Green, like is your Old Testament, and then your New Testament. Robert, Robert, sorry, Tom Green. Yeah, that guy's not that guy. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> Bear Trap. Um, and the New Testament's like how to transcend, you know, those these types of things. Mm-hmm. If everyone rolls around like the Jews in the Old Testament, then. Uh, you're pretty much rolling around just like people tell you to right now, which is, I am the chosen one. All you people are pigs and swine, and I will annihilate, do whatever I have to do to have my promised land, which is pretty much what the Old Testament's all about. And then the New Testament is, no, Gentiles included, everyone's included, men are sovereign. There's plenty of spots. And they and kind of, they, I'm going to have to check that. you on that, Joe, because there's plenty of parts, uh, segments, and especially the first the first four books where it talks about Rights for the sojourner. Um, if if somebody of a different bloodline comes and wants to worship, how they can do that? Basically, an open door. Okay, if you should choose to walk through it. So, in have the you, opportunity. I don't think that the Old Testament is exclusively about people getting land that God gave it to them. No, I think it's about a story about a stubborn people, much like ourselves who have been given grace, given mercy. Those are small given things. Given all but, these things. Yeah. That's the, no, the, the, the most important thing to realize about the Old Testament, in my opinion, is a story of grace and mercy. Because No, not Old Testament. Bro. Absolutely, dude. No way. You need to read it again. Every single time the Jews fall from grace, fall from mercy, God gives them this opportunity to come back out of their undeserving place. This is what happens over and over and over again. And it's because of they cry out to God, God, we're sorry for what we did. We don't deserve it. God reaches back out, gives them a place again. Gives them, he's just waiting for them to actually rely upon him again. That's what he's waiting for. They go and they worship other gods. They get rich and fat, forget about the Lord. Then, you know, calamity comes. What happened? Oh, we forgot about God. So God comes back. This is the story of the Old Testament. This is the story of the Jews. That's within the Jews this deciding is... not to follow God. I'm talking more or less their their campaign to the promised land and how they kept it and how they treated other people many times throughout the Old Testament. Yes, there's a couple instances of them saying, yes, if they want to come in, they will allow it. But a lot of people it got just completely annihilated because they were in their territory. And there's no way to reconcile that. This just was the commandment of God, and this is what they did. Whether or not that was... This What's is, your point? My my point is that the two books are very different within the way that they view the like the inherent value, like we were talking about here, of of each person. Like each person has inherent value in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, that's not always the case. It's just not. 
which I think is which is why the book is so. I I'm not. I'm not saying that. Mm. I love the Old Testament because of that, because it's it's real, and this is the way a lot, the world runs today. I feel like you're this making a very. It's very I think you're making a very, very sweeping worldly. sweeping statement in saying that because they went out and murdered people and took land by force, that those people didn't have equal opportunity. Basically, what you're saying is that God didn't give them the opportunity to repent. There was no grace for these people. They were treated inhumanely or like animals. And so only in the New Testament do you see a God that's able to give everybody grace. Is that what I'm understanding? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't agree with that. No, don't. I feel like when you read the Old Testament, you're going to see the Canaanites, especially the Canaanites, because these are the ones that God told, I believe, Saul to eradicate completely. It specifically said, and I'll have to pull up the verse, but it says they were given, God says, I was, I have given them grace, but their sin is so much that they need to be eradicated. Basically, they have, like Sodom and Gomorrah, once the grace had run out, just the same way it's right. run and out the for New the Testament, Jews. In the New Testament, it says that there's no sin that Christ cannot take over. So it's obviously showing that there's a difference between those there two. There is sin that Christ can you know? If you choose hell, you choose hell. Look at the sin against the Holy Spirit, dude. But you, that's there's something none that, that are those, non-redeemable. You have to for, look for. look at what happens. I think happens. that's specifically to Christians, non-believers. No. What do you mean? I mean, if you're, if you're not going to accept Jesus, your sin is going to bite you. Oh, yeah. I agree. So it's only to believers that that statement applies. Mm-hmm. Well, the we sin against the, the sin again. against the Holy Spirit. People do not realize this. It took me a while when we were doing our notes to understand what this is. Breaking it down very simply is somebody living a life, right? Because we're all going to live our lives, and then rejecting God at the end of it. But in the course of living your life, you were given sufficient evidence to accept Christ, to accept God, and you didn't. So you chose hell. That's the point that he's making about the sins against the Holy Spirit. And you can bet that whole cities would do that. That not just one person, whole Canaanites and we don't, did that. We only got one view of one people. We don't know if they were getting prophets sent to them or what they their were. communications like with was like with God. We see a picture of Jonah doing that. Yes. We, we might not have the whole story of what every mm-hmm. civilization had going on then. Well, look at Balaam. But we do right, know when how you, the when Jews... You saw Balaam the the prophet Balaam, he was not even a Jew. He had correspondence with God, which I always find is interesting. Okay, and the king what was his name. Can't remember his name, but he asked Balaam to curse the Jews because he was afraid because the Jews were already taking over land like crazy. Obviously, God's on their side. So come here, Balaam, curse these people so they won't come take my land. Balaam says, I'm going to talk to God. God says, you're going to bless him. And he, long story short, king doesn't get his way. What does the king do? He still wants to fight the Jews. Like, what would you do if you were in those shoes? If I was in the shoes and I saw these anointed people just coming in, doing whatever they wanted, and, that, and what I have to ask myself is, I'm like, okay, God wants this to happen. I got my own prophet telling me this is what God wants to happen. You know, it's like a suicide mission at that point. I'm just going to go in there and be like, let me go kill these people. I'm going to try my best, even though everybody said no. God said no through Balaam. Look at what's happened with these people. They've already been very successful. Well, I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's, well, it's arrogance. Yeah, sometimes well, that's exactly what um, you know John the Baptist did out in the desert to the Pharisees and the whole thing at Jerusalem. He basically went out there and said, all you guys don't want to believe in this baptism? Well, I'm going to go out to the desert and baptize people anyways. And that's I don't exactly understand the correspondence. I'm just saying, just because society and everyone doesn't line up with what 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 what's going on, doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad idea. To, but John to was not a prophet. It. He was like Balaam. He was an anointed I'm prophet. Just saying, so, just I mean, it's it not always make, the best. He's way not to like judge the king. What doesn't do. have to, the Pharisees? If you were to draw your analogy out, would be like the king. Balaam would be more, or the prophet would be more like John, because he's the one saying. This is an error. Don't do this. Do this instead, whatever that message is. But that's, I really want people to love the Old Testament. There is a truth that you're not going to get anywhere else but by reading that. And yes, there's bloodshed. Yes, there's murder. And to go back to the foreshadowing that he didn't refer to is so many of these stories in the Old Testament are a foreshadow, not of stuff that we go through necessarily, but to Jesus. 
Like so much, so many of that stuff is just mm-hmm. pointing right at Jesus. Absolutely. And we have to be like Jesus, you know, persecution. Obviously, we're not going to be uh, perfect. The Bible, if you're going to be a believer, you have to be able to say, in the words of the creed, that, that, you, be- that you believe in the virgin birth, that you believe, most importantly, in the resurrection. And, 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 and as you well know, Jordan, many of us can walk 99% of the way there in terms of belief in the, in the, in the truth of the story. Or as Betjeman puts it, but is it true? Is it true? And then stumble on the last thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So one of the things you pointed out in your conversation. Yeah, well, that, that's actually from the beginning clip. Um, and I think that is, as we talked about in our previous podcasts about Jordan, like so many Christian or so many people like academics. these two, these academics are like taking that view of Christianity, which I think is a unfortunate view because there's a lot of people that follow them and I think do the same thing then like I will you know like we talked about I don't uh, like that one girl I talked to she said I couldn't claim I believe in God because I don't like live up to the standard or something uh, yeah and it's it's like a false view that like gets well, people so grace? close and then then it's like are they gonna stay on this line because they think it's good enough or are they gonna do something with it. I feel like it's a self-lacerating figure that I I read about in Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky. Thanks, Joe. I knew I messed that up. But uh, it's a figure that wants to appear so noble in their decisions that there's an arrogance in the background, so they forget that grace and mercy are the movers so like that girl right or like jordan i don't live up to being a christian i am not good enough it's like they don't know the story it's like they i want to appear so noble in the fact that i know my wretchedness but christ is the redeeming element and there is grace so what do you do with that or what should you be doing with that it's almost missing the whole point. <laughs> I'd say so, right? Mm-hmm. So what do they really want to do when they do that? Is have their cake and eat it. Say, like, I know this is good stuff, but I don't know Jesus is big enough to deal with my stuff, right? I thought he was talking about the resurrection being literal or not. Well, in that case, off on that? In that? No, he was, but... That was on the other topic. Oh, okay, okay. okay. But yeah, um, you know. I think that the resurrection, personally, I remember when I was in high school, we were doing something in literature class, and they were talking about like near-death experiences and miraculous things, and some girl just did this report, and then it she, a lot of people come back from the dead, man. <laughs> A lot of people come back from the dead people. Yeah. <laughs> it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Not to diminish my Christ, Savior, our Christ, Lord, and that resurrection. But it does happen. I want, There's accounts I want of count this a, happening for a lot. I want to count near death experience as death, though. No, no, no. no. That was uh, a part of her report. There was also sort of, you know, the Lazarus effect, I think she was calling it, things where people <clears throat> were dead. Um, and people have, you know, evidence of people coming back. So I have to, I mean, Lazarus was obviously, he was raised from the death before Jesus was, you know. Um, so people, all I'm saying is that, I don't know. They, okay, I well, know what I'm trying to say. I th- okay, like, miracles, like, we, we have a hierarchy for miracles, right? Mm-hmm. So um, if I was to see somebody just be like, oh, here's a rabbit, all of a sudden. I go, oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe that's uh, maybe a three out of ten. You know, somebody raising from the dead, that's like, you know, a seven. But what if Christ, like, you know, took a star and just, like, shoved it right here and you could see it, you know? And without burning alive. Without burning alive, yeah. It's like something just nuts on, like, a monolithic scale, right? 
put everyone consciousness into one consciousness something like second. that you know <laughs> just everybody just you could dream some crazy stuff up right mm-hmm. so that's what i was trying to say yeah. is like is it that crazy like and that's why i love when jonathan brings up the big banks he's like that's that's even more nuts in if many this ways is, this is why i believe and i totally understand what jordan peterson talks about with like it's the story that's more true and what's most important is because yes People raised from the dead and have been for a while. That's not the most amazing part about it, whether it happened or it's true or not. Um, for a lot of people, yes, it might be the defining point of the religion, but for a lot of people, the story is what's most important, which is an all-powerful being bringing himself low to save something that he loves that was undeserving of that love. And living a life like they lived, a whole entire life, and then sacrificing himself so he could have closeness with them because he wouldn't have that closeness mm-hmm. otherwise. And that is what love is. Finish the story, though. What? Finish it. That's it. Trying. You got a 20% left. Right. And then he gives them the choice to accept that love, right? To 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 be a part of that love. And that, for me, well, he sacrificed the most, well, himself a big and point. came back to life. That's well, he the did, point, obviously. Well, he's I a mean, living God, right? Well, so he has to be able to bear the burden of, of sacri- sin. There's a whole many, there's so many stories of Correct. people so sacrificing. He's got to be the living God. So that's why the resurrection. Well, I didn't didn't I say resurrected? No, I didn't. Okay, well, I that's what I meant to, to say there. is he, obviously he resurrected, okay. living and God. Uh, transcended death mm. because he's God and he's able to do that. Transcended death and was able to give us a second chance. So we accept that second chance, and that to me is what's most beautiful because that's how we end up using grace and sort of being able to, as civilizations work throughout history you know, pick up the pieces when everything goes to shit and then able to move on because we have to do that So every so often within history and we have to do that within our relationships and we have to do that with ourselves when we fail in life all the time. We have to be like, you know what? I'm not going to go jump off a building today <laughs> because I'm an absolute piece of crap um, or, you know, treat ourselves that way. And there's a lot of people that d- don't have that problem naturally. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I'm definitely not one of those people. <laughs> I definitely want to die a lot. And um, if it wasn't for Christ, maybe I, I probably wouldn't be here. But I wouldn't. The idea yeah, is, no, is like, no way. I, couldn't, I could never be a nihilist and just be like, drugs, sex, screw people over. Like, I'd just be like, it's too much work, dude. Like, <laughs> sick of it already, bro. <laughs> sick of it already. But, you know, like, this, the resurrection, like, I don't understand... How if you thought, again, it comes back to miracles. Like, I think the miracle of Western civilization, if I was just in my carnal mind to pit everything up against one another and say, like, Jesus raising from the dead or the miracle of Jesus' story impacting a whole civilization for hundreds of hundreds of years and benefiting humanity in that profound way that the West has, what's a bigger miracle? I mean, arguably, you couldn't have the, res- you couldn't have the Western miracle without the resurrection. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's stupid to try and do. But if you're just to try and for the exercise of miracles, I mean, it would be that. The West or, the West being a miraculous thing that we live in every day. Well, it's almost a So silly... how can they not just accept Christ did that if he's able to do that? Especially if they're to willing that. to, like, some, like, accept the idea of God. Like, if, if you can accept the idea of, an, of a deity, the idea that there could be miraculous events seems to be obvious. Mm-hmm. And they shouldn't even really be, like, a giant problem Crazy. with it yeah yeah like someone like he can't raise himself from the yeah. dead like what kind is of he god, god are we put yeah. what kind of god is he <laughs> <Isn't> it, yeah <laughs> exactly. like, what is this yeah <laughs> like why are we even talking about him as a god? like a god and they want yeah. then they want material or natural explanations for like a supernatural event which makes no sense either yeah like jonathan says this forensic you know method of it's, evaluating miracles like even that, How does that even work? when he talks about like the writing of the of jesus's resurrection in the bible like even today what are we going to write about like something like that like we're going to describe the event we're not going to get into the details of like some sort of materialistic explanation anyway like could you oh, even, even science could you, you even, go into like quantum physics some of those theories are just so crazy like you go into like string theory and vibrations yeah. and how like much space is between them and like viewing a particle actually makes the particle exist. I don't know if makes is the right word to say, but when you view something, it actually exists. And the idea of perception being the defining factor within what materializes and why it materializes and vibrations and the way that like 
everything. I remember when I was in uh, Dude, middle scientists. school, and they were talking about like you know put your hands on the table, and it's like these are positive and uh, negative electrons basically fighting against each other. Otherwise, your hand would just go right through the table. And he's like, there is a possibility that one day your hand just might go through the table because it's in the realm of possibilities. Is likely, no, but it is it possible. Yes. You know what so I don't we deal in a realm of possibilities, which if you think about a supernatural idea, you know, what how it's possible. A lot of the stuff is possible. It's just not plausible, you know, which are two different things, you know. And if you're worshiping a supernatural god, then well, if he created it, he's probably got those skeleton keys and he can probably do what the hell and he wants to do. Even if you like I always thought Absolutely. like a miracle, let's just say it's like a physical body type miracle. Why would he need to do something that's so ob like Let's say your heart stops. Like, if he goes in and like flips your heart back on, like it's probably going to look like a natural reason that that happened, even oh, though absolutely. he would have came in and I've always thought of like, that. So, yeah. Like so, like the like the idea of there being some sort of proof there mm -hmm. of super like it doesn't make sense. It doesn't to me. make it any less of a miracle. It makes it make more sense because he made this stuff. Yeah, I agree. You know, the scientists out there that are in the quantum realm. Uh, Man, I'm reading this book by Stephen Mayer. It's way above my pay grade, bro. But uh, you, what I've come to understand is these theories that these guys have made, like the multiverse um, string theory, these different quantum theories. There's so many arbitrary sets for parameters that they make up themselves. Like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, the universal uh, constant, they make this stuff up, man. They're not using parameters that come from natural places. These are theories. But what I've really understood is it's like, yeah, okay, so that Music. could be... No, it's even worse than... It's just basic <laughs> words. Because it's not... What I mean to say is music has harmony in it, right? And we can sort of and identify. Dissonance. And dissonance. And they work together to Pleasing refresh each other, things. right? Dissonance. Like you have too much harmony. You're refreshed by dissonance. All that. The problem is... They love their science so much and the fact that they came up with it that no matter how obscure it is, and it gets obscure, guys. I've, I've gets, read about that. The crazy. one had like 90 just arbitrary constants Dude, thrown in to make the equation like, work. What is this? <laughs> it's like, like that's worse than a miracle. It's that's an just, echo chamber, like you said it's earlier just, on. It, but they're so proud of themselves, man. And Why I'm not? like, it's like the endless. Song. And I'm like, you know, you, you can accept that, but you can't accept the, the resurrection. Like, and you're the guy who made this up. Like, you're playing God, dude. Anybody can see that. Because you don't like the other alternative. You're willing to make something up. Yeah. And say that's fine. And these are really smart guys. Much mm -hmm. smarter than 10 of my brains put together. So, 20 of my brains put together. So that always shocked me. You know? Do we have one more clip? I think, well, I think we could probably wrap up. Wrap we got, up. like, a list of okay. potentially more. Um, okay. But, the, you know, kind of what I wrote down, too, just about the conversation in general, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a, the conversation they're having is, frankly, kind of pointless <laughs> if God doesn't exist. So if you're going into this conversation that they're having with the presupposition that an atheist would, the whole conversation is meaningless because everything they're talking about is kind of an illusion because nihilism is the ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of like... To me, it's a little bit funny to have, like, when these big minds that are truly claimed atheists have these conversations because it's like you're playing it, you're, you're living an illusion mm -hmm. of thinking there's morality and thinking there's these questions even to talk about. Why? Yeah. Why do they? Because you'd have to have a creator that had some kind of morality, like, written it on your heart somewhere down the line. You know, yeah, you can't make doing any... something really, really naughty and you just know. You it's can't make any right. rational you logical argument. This, you know, <laughs> you can't make any logical argument as to why a human being has intrinsic value yeah. without there being something outside of those human beings that created them. Yep. Right. Like somebody. I'll take it a step further: is to like the civilizations that do adhere to that have done typically much better mm -hmm. than the other ones mm -hmm. historically. Also, it's interesting, like. Um, When, Andrew, when when Douglas said, you know, I'd like a world 
Yeah, he, he worded it with like a little, a little drop of condescension. Like I would tolerate, or I'd be okay with mildly, or something like that. A world where most people abided by a Judeo-Christian. He's like, but I wouldn't believe it. But it would be like you know a good world, and um, it's in those better than living in a castle. But I mean, it's like in those comments that you're just like. Law. Well, if everybody else is living great and you'd prefer to live in that world, then what the heck, bro? Like, well, it's, it's utilitarianism, heck? kind of. Like, but still, like, who wouldn't want to not live in one of those worlds, right? But you're living in an illusion, still. Yeah. And I, a lot of people are okay with accepting an illusion. Just think of the whole concept of the Matrix movie. Like, yeah. people willingly take the blue pill. Like, I enjoy mm-hmm. my life of knowing it's a Matrix, but. It's still enjoyable. And, and, uh, and I don't um, think about that enough. That's also in, that's, that's John Savage out of Brave New World. Freedom is suffering. Freedom is pain. Mm. Here's a life where you get everything you want, John Savage. Here's the girl that you love that wants to bang you repeatedly but doesn't respect you as a man won't have you honor her. He doesn't want any of that stuff. He wants to earn her. He wants to earn his, he wants to earn his comforts. He wants to earn his freedom. And he understands that that is what's of value to him. He doesn't just want comfort. For mm-hmm. comfort's sake, he wants freedom. I think which that means that's pain the and suffering same, and earning. I think, I think that that's the same reason why they're talking about it, because they're not comfortable with comfort. It's not enough. Like not Douglas enough. can write as many books as he wants, <clears throat> and so can you know. I think Jonathan just look at his little brilliant, cute little face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he seems comfortable in a in a very unique way. You know and you know, I see him carving his icons, and there's something that, without a doubt, makes sense, and that is the fulfillment of a believer. We get calm in the storm, and I do believe that's why people come back to it, man, because like John Savage, they would rather have truth than comfort. Yeah, you know? freedom is, is suffering and pain, and resurrection allows us to keep moving forward and um, keeps us alive. So Amen. we have to be able to resurrect. Mm-hmm. Renewal the mind. It. We have to do it. Yes. Great conversation. Indeed. Awesome. If you want to close, I can move my mic. and Let's do it. Okay. Thank you, Father, for this great conversation, for getting us back in this podcast studio. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word and how it's fed us. And even in the times of longing and suffering and loneliness, you've been there. And you always are there. You're that constant love and that figure of embrace that we all want and need so dearly. Lord, show us how to share it with others. And the rest of this week, um, keep us safe and uh, allow us to edify the church in the ways that you deem a need. Thank you, Lord, in your mighty name. Amen.